our website and our YouTube page. So it's my pleasure today to introduce today's speakers uh, who will be giving a talk about the Western Yellow Rail. Our first speaker is Ken Popper, who worked as a wildlife biologist and conservation planner for the Nature Conservancy in Oregon for over two decades. Among other things, this included surveying and tagging listed birds and fish species, leading multi-state eco-regional assessments, and identifying climate resilient landscapes across the Pacific Northwest. He's currently helping to expand the MODIS network in Oregon and working with the Western Yellow Rail Working Group to track breeding population numbers and identify overwintering locations. And our sp second speaker today is Mike Green, who has over 30 years of experience as a federal employee, 22 of those with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Division of Migratory Birds in Portland, Oregon. He is a longtime member of the Partners in Flight community, but works in some capacity on bird conservation of all bird groups that live in or transit through the Western US, including secretive marsh birds. Ken introduced Mike to yellow rails in the upper Klamath region of Oregon in the early 2000s, and he's been hooked ever since. Ken and Mike will be talking about yellow rails in the West and the work of the Western Yellow Rail Working Group. So thank you both Ken and Mike, and I'll turn it over to you for your presentation. Thanks, Quinn. Um, yeah, I'm going to be speaking first and hand it off to, to Ken. Um, I just wanted to comment. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, and I see a great number of friends and colleagues on uh, who have joined us today. And, and um, one of one of my friends, Jen Newland, I need to give a shout out to her because you'll see that that both Ken and I are sporting the same background, which is our logo for our group. And if you are envious of the artwork, um, chat Jen Newland separately because she was responsible for developing this and she's a fantastic graphic artist among other things. So um, yeah, uh, let me without further ado, share my screen and remember to share the sound. There it is, clicked, I'm gonna share that screen, get organized there. Hopefully you all can see that screen. Thumbs up, yes or verbal. Looks good. Thank you. Great. Yeah, so Ken and I um, are representing actually a much larger group of folks uh, as we give this presentation. I'm going to be kicking us off with a little bit of the history of our group, but some really some basics about how we formed up, what we knew about Yellow Rails um, up until the formation of our group. And then Ken's going to continue on with a much more deeper dive into the biology of, of Yellow Rails and some of the work that we're doing and um, we're gonna try to stay on time. If you guys have questions, yeah, please just ask and start them in the chat. At the end of it though, we'll try to get to all those questions in the chat and entertain your questions. And I might ask some of the representatives, other representatives of our uh, working group to join us in, in answering some of those questions because I see you out there and thank you for joining us. Keep us on track. So yeah, um, Western Yellow Rails. Uh, yellow rails are among that group of birds, secret of marsh birds. Not a lot is known about those birds relative to other others because they are so secretive. Um, let me make sure that we are going. There we go. What do we know about yellow rail distribution? Well, this is the map from uh, Birds of the World. Uh, shows a broad distribution breeding in many of the central Canadian provinces up to, off to the east migrating through the central U.S. as far as we know and wintering along the Gulf Coast and the southeastern coast and through much of Florida, according to this map, a little blob in eastern Oklahoma, western Arkansas. That is really the bulk of the yellow rails distribution in the world, aside from a very small portion of the population of the breeds in northern California in South Central Oregon. And that, those birds are really the focus of this working group right now. Um, we believe they winter down around the Bay Area of California. Um, given that there's such a small population, uh, both Oregon and California have recognized them as species of greatest conservation need in their uh, wildlife action plans. Um, Oregon has designated them as sensitive critical and California as a species of special concern. Both of the Fish and Wildlife Service and Canada have recognized the bird 
in different ways, a bird of conservation concern by the Fish and Wildlife Service generally across the U.S. and uh, Canada has recognized them as a, a species of special concern. Recently updated, actually, just uh, within uh, the recent months, um, redesignating them uh, by the same designation as uh, species of special concern. And they'll be coming out, by the way, with a, a new status assessment uh, for that species. R2R, of course, this is a tipping point within um, the R2R spectrum and uh, because of its small population generally and a lack of data. So a lot of people recognize this as a bird of concern generally, but particularly in the West where we've got such a small breeding population. These, this is um, a map of eBird records showing their abundance or rather their distribution, not their abundance. And which shows largely the same picture. This is a modeled map of modeled um, uh, of their distribution based on habitat preferences as well as occurrence data uh, resulting in this map. Uh, of their uh, presumed distribution. And you can see again, the blob down in um, central Oregon, which is less to do with California and much more to do with Oregon in this map, which is actually um, the case. Zooming in on the Oregon population. This is a closer look at their um, distribution. Again, this is the eBird map of their distribution, the model distribution taking into account uh, habitat distribution as well as where they've been detected in eBird. And on the left, um, a little bit of the, about the history of quote unquote discovery. Of course, um, this is in the written record. Um, undoubtedly, this has been a bird of, of note in uh, the native cultures in the area. Nonetheless, um, in terms of the written record, uh, breeding was first documented in the Klamath County area, which is really where we're looking here on this map in Oregon, in the um, late 20s to about 1930. Um, and then there were no records after that point in Oregon. No one had uh, relocated birds, or I'm not sure what effort was expended, but they were considered extirpated up until about 1981. In 1982, they were rediscovered in the Wood River Valley down here, this sort of blob in this area. And um, I wanna give a shout out to Mark Stern. I see he joined us. He was critical in this work uh, between 88 and 2006 with the Nature Conservancy and partners. Um, he and several others completed lots of surveys across dozens of sites, um, Actually, through the early 90s, not even the central site of Klamath Marsh had been monitored, but all these sites um, Mark visited, got Ken involved in uh, the mid 90s, and uh, together conducted lots and lots of surveys across these sites, really to, to discover the uh, extent of yellow rail populations breeding in this area. Where were they? Um, how many could they find? And so just uh, uh, trying to, to discern the, um, the distribution of birds. The maximum count at that point was uh, 236 males counted in 20, uh, 2002 with a full survey of, of many of the sites where they'd been, they'd been discovered. And we estimated their, um, their numbers at about 300 pairs. Through 2020, uh, there were a few other sites that were added to the list. Uh, they're down at the bottom, down in Northern California in the Lassen area and Goose Lake um, to the east at Summer Lake. It's over here. A few birds have been sighted up at Sun River, up in this area of, of Oregon. Um, but predominantly birds, uh, the, the, most of the birds were breeding in Oregon. After 2020, no breeding birds were heard down in uh, Northeastern California um, and a lot of the Oregon locations were drying up, no longer had breeding populations. We'll have more on that later. And this is this slide here is really to show you a little bit about yellow rails and why they're so tricky to find. You can see, of course, they're sort of yellowish, brownish, uh, blending with the vegetation that they love, these uh, sedges and grasses. This is a male with its yellow bill here in the upper, um, upper photograph. This is a female that Ken took a picture of. You don't get to see a lot of females when you're doing this work, 
she's got a slightly darker bill, um, definitely blending in to the vegetation. This is normally what you look at when you're walking through their vegetation. There's actually a yellow rail in this picture, folks. There's not even a lot of thatch in, um, in this, uh, this photo of old and senescent vegetation, but there's, there's a yellow rail. I'll give you a second to, I know you're looking for this bird, but I'll give you a, a little bit of help. It's right there. You can see it's back. Um, they definitely blend in to the vegetation. If they were standing still, in the vegetation like this, you would just walk right past this bird. This is why we work on them at night. They're a little bit more, um, well, they make their presence known. This is when they call to each other. They sing, I'll just call it singing. Um, they advertise their territories, the males do. And this is, uh, I'm gonna start the video rolling. This is me clicking rocks. This video was taken by Lily Calderon just last summer. Um, this is how we call, he's clicking back at me, you can hear it, he stopped clicking. Um, Tom Will knows this work, he's, you know, here he comes, coming into the arena that I've tamped down uh, because he's trying to chase me out of his territory. Uh, and if you're interested in catching this bird, this is what you do, you um, tamp, you attract them to your location, you tamp down this little arena, hopefully he'll come to this sort of matted down vegetation. And very soon, when he's looking relaxed, um, you'll throw the net over the top of him and, and catch him. Um, yeah, that would be a little bit of a sketchy catch there. But as he comes more into the arena, this would be the way to do it. He cares not that you've got a blaring headlight over your head. He's more just interested in uh, finding that, that male that is in his territory, which, of course, is you clicking rocks or playing back a sound be a recording, but since Ken taught me how to click rocks in the early 2000s, I have not done it any differently. We're going to move on. Um, that's the organic way to do it, and I, I've um, dedicated rock clicking. You have to re-perfect the technique every, every summer because the rhythm is critical. All right, what what, what happened with with our work on yellow rails um, in the late 90s and in 2005? We did a lot of work on yellow rails, um, banded over uh, 400 males. Uh, some of those resulted in recaptures the following year. Um, in the third year, a couple of birds had been recaptured, indicating some site faithfulness and phylopatry at some level. We needed to, to figure that out a little more closely. Remarkably, the work of Mark and, and Ken, um, through the work, their work, they. Ken mostly found 34 nests. I'm not sure anyone else in the world has found as many nests as Ken Popper. Um, he developed a search image and became very good at figuring out where those little birds are nesting. Um, and generally those nests are covered in some layer of senescent vegetation. They're sort of dome nests. They require that sort of dead and dying vegetation from uh, several years of, of growth. And, um, but some use live vegetation to create their domes. We learned that um, the hatch dates are between about early August or early June and mid and early August. And, but they might start forming their nests as early as April and uh, chicks fledge as late as mid-September. Ken also did some telemetry on some males and tracked them them across um, through their uh, breeding, their time breeding, and found that they actually ranged quite broadly. Um, as the males needed to stay, or were always seeking this optimum habitat condition of about seven centimeters of water depth. So this is fairly shallow water. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about their habitat preference. This is a, thank you, Ron Larson. I'm not sure if you're on or not, but um, Ron has is a former Fish and Wildlife Service employee, is still very active in the area and took this aerial photograph of the main, one of the main sites at Klamath Marsh National Wildlife Refuge where uh, yellow rails hang out. This is a closer look at their optimum habitat with a little bit of thatch. Um, there's some, some water showing there. Again, about seven centimeters of water is the average uh, that these males are seeking. And as they're searching out this seven centimeters, as the marsh dries through the summer, they're gonna move to find that seven centimeters. A little bit about the working group now. So 
I brought you up to date about through about um, 2002 ish. Uh, there was some additional work um, in, in between 2006 and 2012. Um, we conducted one thorough survey in 2006. Uh, well, it wasn't complete, but a partial survey. And um, some folks from uh, USGS got interested in yellow rails and did a little bit of radio, radio telemetry work. That was Sean Murphy. Um, there was interest by the refuge. Faye Weekly as well uh, was a biologist there at the time. Um, but uh, the working group idea really didn't get lifted. Um, and it usually comes down to one person really to push forward this idea and, uh, and re-energize um, a community of people. And that person in this case was Jeremy Welch. Um, he was hired by the complex and uh, brought new energy. Um, he and Ron Larson, again, I'm mentioning Ron, gave Ken Popper and sent him an email about resurveying the refuge for yellow rails. Ken and I got together and uh, with Jeremy's in, uh, energy, um, uh, his, his uh, supervisor, John Vradenberg, and um, some interest by Jeremy Kellerman at Oregon Institute of Technology, we launched the working group and to, to finally um, try to get our collective minds together to do something about the conservation of these birds. Um, there's a picture of the early days, 2021. Yes, we are a new group. Uh, it uh, was about 20 members strong in the early years, uh, conducted our first survey since tw 2002, complete survey of all known uh, breeding locations in Oregon. And um, we've continued those surveys in subsequent years. We've added significantly, we've added Miles Shiring. He's also on this call. So thanks Miles for, for jumping in, um, who's working um, with ARUs to help us with our detection of yellow rails in areas across um, their breeding range. We'll talk more about that later. The feather isotope work, which is a particular interest of Jeremy Kellerman. And um, more recently added uh, a USGS researcher, Lori Hall, who's very active in the wintering, doing uh, wintering ground surveys. We'll talk more about that as we go. Here are some of our partners, pretty good distribution of federal partners and state partners. Oregon State uh, University with Miles and uh, Christian Hagen, um, his, um, his uh, supervisor on this, Nature Conservancy, of course, and looking for future partners. We want to grow. This is how we operate. Um, Amy Walsh, I'm not sure if you're on, but she's our fearless leader. Um, it is other duties as assigned, but uh, definitely she's doing a great job keeping us organized, keeping our calls uh, together every monthly and setting agendas for us. Our membership's up to about 30 now, plus or minus. Um, we'll take more. We do everything through teams. We have monthly calls. We have a summer survey rendezvous, and um, that's our one chance to get there together in a face-to-face -face way. Uh, it's also a ton of fun. Join us. We've got a charter that we're drafting, a strategic plan that's on the list and developing sub teams around some of the significant ways we uh, interact with each other. We wanna grow our group. There are other people we can collaborate with. Really yellow rails share a habitat type with Oregon spotted frog, a listed species. Um, uh, there's a, a special species of lamprey who's, uh, that's also in the area uh, that, um, that is of interest to many uh, tribes have an interest in what we're doing and are, will be collaborators with us on some motors projects, we hope. Um, there's ranchers, there's uh, the ag community, there's um, national and international interests. And um, what do we wanna do? Well, Amy's doing a great job, but she's got a lot of other jobs to do. So we would probably benefit from some, some sort of full-time coordinator, of course. And money would help us launch some of the more, um, uh, some, some more conservation focused work. Some of those are, are listed here. Land manager's guide for the private lands that used to have um, yellow rails and could again. Uh, and uh, some work on data management would be helpful. There's a picture of Miles holding a yellow rail. Threats, what do we know? Well. No surprise, climate change and drought are at the top of the list. Uh, lower snowpack means less runoff, earlier runoff, uh, changing the landscape. 
um, water management, egg development, um, increased groundwater pumping, particularly in the west of the refuge, has changed the, the distribution of water at the Klamath site and probably others as well. Grazing, um, possibly pollution, pathogens, we don't know. This is a picture in the upper right of actually a Klamath Marsh Refuge. We'll show you where on the refuge that is uh, in a map a little bit later, but with the drying uh, of portions of the refuge, fire is more of a, of a risk. Um, indeed, that happened last summer. This is from last September and yellow rails um, were in some of this habitat. The drop in the groundwater level, this is Ken, probably as 2021. It, we did get a little bit of a reprieve in the winter of 22, 23, um, which had slightly high, which delivered to the refuge some, some additional water. It wasn't quite that bad last year, but um, continues to be an issue. Grazing at Four Mile, where um, this location is where there used to be a center of abundance for, for, for yellow rails, um, no longer. Uh, we think that's had an effect. This is Sycan Marsh, a TNC preserve. Um, there's been continued drying there, and there was a fire that went through uh, 2021, I believe, um, which really had drastic effects on the landscape. So um, drying, drought, fire, nothing new, uh, but with water management, we think we can at least change some of the landscape for yellow rails. Ken, I'm going to hand it to you. And I can't hear you, Ken. All right, how's that? Sounds good. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go over some of the, the population numbers. Um, and as kind of, as Mike referred to, there was about a 20 year period in the middle where not much uh, surveying was done, um, nothing range wide throughout Oregon. Um, on this uh, chart, if you uh, click the button once, Mike, you can, we'll see that uh, the numbers from 2000 to 2002, we hit a high point of a total number of males heard uh, down at the bottom of that chart at 236, and a little over 70% of those birds were at Klamath Marsh. So, but we had good distribution um, at Four Mile, and particularly in the Wood River Valley, uh, that was uh, more than a dozen smaller sites, uh, generally private land, and uh, there was good water levels, and uh, the birds were kind of, you know, everywhere. You'd go out driving and walking at night, and, and you can hear these birds sometimes calling as far as a mile away if, if everything else is pretty quiet. Uh, more recently, um, so the last three years we've done surveys uh, with the working group. Um, it takes a, a bunch of people to do these walking surveys, but um, we heard a, a total of 147 last year, so certainly a drop. And over 90% of the birds have been at Klamath Marsh. So even though there's fewer birds, higher percentage of them are at Klamath Marsh. And you can see there's quite a few zeros on the right-hand side of that table. Um, and uh, I'll show you a, a map that shows how many of those sites kind of blinked out in the last 20 years. Um, all right, next slide. This is a, a chart showing those numbers uh, with the addition of the survey down at Klamath Marsh in 2006. So the blue represents the total birds at Klamath Marsh. The orange is the additional birds found elsewhere. And then the numbers for the statewide survey. So again, you see the visually that drop from the early 2000s um, to the last few years. And there's basically been a drought in those intervening years, which is uh, likely the reason uh, that those numbers have dropped so much. Okay. Zooming in to Klamath Marsh National Wildlife Refuge, uh, that's a, a aerial image of the refuge on the right. Those lighter areas are marsh, or in some cases, most cases, what used to be marsh. Um, the tiny little dots in orange are the locations of calling male yellow rails 
in 2006, and they all the way from the uh, southwest corner of uh, the marsh where uh, the Williamson River exits the marsh um, to the uh, uh, northern tip. Uh, there's even some a uh, couple of yellow rails up there, which if you go out there now, it's basically sagebrush. Um, and then the Williamson River flows in uh, predominantly a, a, a spring-fed system uh, for this site flows in and is then constricted through the middle part of the marsh. Um, and uh, there's trees on either side of that and it flows through there. And you can see that the, the blue dots are the locations of rails in 2022, a couple of years ago. And even though we had the same, basically the same number of males calling there as in 2006, the locations are just confined to a, a ever smaller portion of the marsh and where most of those birds are in 2022 was way too wet in 2006. Um, and you can imagine this this marsh is basically kind of like a bathtub in the sense with a with a a drain in the middle and and that plug has been pulled and the water coming in is just not coming in fast enough to, to keep that bathtub full. Um, so uh, sadly, there's not a lot of habitat left and we're getting some just incredible densities of yellow rails. The graph on the left shows the drought basically at a water station uh, on, the, on the southern part of the marsh. And you can see there was a high point uh, for the water in the year 2000. And since then, it has just continually dropped uh, with the seasonal variation going back up each year, but it, it's dropped. And since 2020, it's dropped further. So that's the situation there. But we're, we're thankful that, that that site is there because without it, we might not have yellow rails in the western U.S. Um, that map was put together by Miles Shiring. He's on the call. Uh, he's the, the graduate student that started up with Christian Hagen at OSU. It's great to have them uh, doing that work. And he's got two major goals in the next few years. Um, he's putting out ARUs or, or automated recording units and using those to record each evening during the breeding season and picking up yellow rails as well as anything else that's calling. And he's going to compare that to the walk-in surveys, see how, how those efforts compare, as well as how many additional birds is he picking up at all of the sites he's putting uh, ARUs out at. Um, because, you know, people can only be out there occasionally. And some of the sites, we don't even have the the uh the people to go out and survey those sites at night because all this work is done at night so those ARUs are are going to be helpful on the left and then he'll use that information to to create a occupancy model related to water depth and vegetative color and hopefully help us uh, you know, map out um, additional habitats and learn how to better manage what we have uh, on the next slide, the image on the left is an ARU. It's about the size of a pack of cards, even smaller than that. Um, in the middle is uh, um, a photo at Summer Lake uh, with the intrepid Marty St. Louis, who discovered yellow rails there uh, in the early 2000s and has had a handful of them there ever since. It happens to be outside the Klamath Basin, so on a slightly different um, water regime, and we think that's part of the reason that yellow rails have persisted there. And then on the right is a photo or a, an image of that narrowest part of the Klamath Marsh Refuge. The white dots are Miles's uh, ARUs, dozens of ARUs he's put out there. And the orange outline is where that fire was in September of last year. So uh, it's a little worrisome that it burned up about half the yellow rail, occupied yellow rail habitat there, but it's going to serve as a great uh, research comparison uh, for next year. So fingers crossed um, 
the uh, the fire wasn't too deep and and the vegetation bounces back quickly um miles has done a ton of work um and with the help of everybody else in the working group and put out he put out 65 ARUs last year across 19 different sites, incredible amount of work, and is partnering with the University of Pittsburgh to use their yellow rail call classifier mm -hmm. to have a computer look through those 10,000 hours of recordings to find uh, where uh, yellow rails calls have been recorded. We've already got some early results in 2022 that um, do show that those ARUs can pick up calls outside of the human surveys. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's certainly a valuable tool. Mm -hmm. uh, this is that map zoomed in a little bit, showing all those sites where Miles was putting out mm -hmm. uh, ARUs, and I've classified them um, to show the sites in gray or sites where yellow rails have never been confirmed. Fingers crossed they are used pick up something. The sites in orange are sites where yellow rails used to be found, but have not been heard in the last few years. Again, in large part due to that drought and the habitat just drying up. Uh, fingers crossed, we'll find them again this year, but um, it, it shows you that basically half the known sites have blinked out. And so that's our, our cause for concern. The big question we have uh, after, you know, we know a lot about breeding habitat, when they breed, where they breed. We do not know that about winter in the Western US. Uh, there are those historic locations, mostly in California during the winter. Um, but we've got a couple of efforts to try to identify the wintering grounds. Jeremy Kellerman from Oregon Institute of Technology is uh, leading the effort on uh, looking at uh, some feather samples that we've taken during banding, looking at those isotopes. The idea is that the birds probably molt their flight feathers in the fall in the breeding grounds or near the breeding grounds and then the body feathers in the winter. And so we're hopeful that those isotopes will help narrow down uh, the geography of where these birds are overwintering. Uh, the second effort to identify that is being led by Lori Hall from USGS along with um, her uh, cohorts cohort of uh, other employees in USGS and uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, they've put together a great project um, looking at uh, trying to find yellow whales in San Francisco Bay. And then if neither of those two efforts work or depending on those results, we're looking at using MODIS or GPS tracking in the future. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a map that Jeremy Kellerman put together uh, using all kinds of data from museum records to eBird and everything in between, showing all the historic locations for yellow rails in the Western US. And uh, to answer an earlier question, yes, this does actually go up into BC a little bit, the, the full map. Um, the locations in yellow and green are the breeding season locations. And then the months, uh, January and December, are in the darker blue and red colors. Most of the dots on this map are from the 1900s, uh, especially the red ones. Um, and the dots in on the east side of the Sierras in California are pretty much all in the 1900s. Um, and that's where there used to be birds breeding uh, on the east side of the Sierras in California, but that is not the case any longer. Um, zooming in to San Francisco Bay uh, is where the most recent wintering records are for California, at least the, the most dense um, collection of those. And 
This is a map that Lori Hall produced showing those basically individual bird locations that were either seen by birders or by people like herself studying black rails. So we use those locations to prioritize where to look for yellow rails using um, taking advantage of some new information from Texas. And Mike's going to play a video here. And if you listen after about 20 seconds here, um, they documented a new breeding, a new wintering call that nobody realized um, existed. And they, they're calling it a bugle call. And uh, to my ears, it sounds like a very distant sandhill crane. And those of us who spend time out in the marsh think, well, yeah, maybe I've heard that in the past, but had no idea it might be a yellow rail. Um, Mike's going to play it again. So... Um, Chris Butler and others in Texas uh, found that, documented it, have been very generous in sharing information. Um, and we're using that in California and San Francisco Bay to look for yellow rails. It's uh, was, we were very happy to realize this past breeding season in Oregon that the breeding birds actually react to that call. We played that call during the breeding season and yellow rails aggressively reacted to it. So we're confident that uh, yellow rails will react to that call uh, during the winter as well. So we're looking for responses for that, as well as um, identifying locations for two other uh, important rail species in San Francisco Bay, the Black Rail and Ridgeways Rail. Lori's put out um, a series of ARUs across six sites. And these are those locations basically corresponding to the map of uh, yellow or orange dots of recent observations, as well as locations where black rails are known to exist. We think that we, we know in Texas that there's overlap in the habitat and we assume the same uh, in California. So she's got ARUs out. Um, uh, lent to her effort by OSU. So it's a great use of, you've got ARUs used in the breeding season that are also being used during the winter uh, in a different location. Um, and then uh, we're also doing uh, in-person surveys. Uh, she's out there with, with help um, you, playing that uh, Texas wintering call, hoping for a response. And then is also collecting water samples to do environmental DNA on those three species. This is something that has uh, been accomplished for black rails on the East Coast, and we're hoping uh, to pick up uh, positive locations for uh, at least one, if not all three of those uh, rail species in the San Francisco Bay. All right. Sorry to push you a little bit, Ken. Um, got a note from Paul that we got to move on to questions soon. So we want to leave a little bit of time for that before the end of the hour. Um, just quickly though, moving forward, again, I've touched on this where we want to go with the working group. Um, definitely additional participation from a, a broader group of people, more voices at the table, more perspectives. Um, there was a mention in the chat about uh, birds in British Columbia, definitely in the Northeast, there's been documented um, yellow rails there. Also west of the Rockies in BC, there's some intriguing records and site, uh, site records in, in Eber that um, would be worth exploring. And uh, we dabbled in genetics, uh, Ken and I, in the mid-80s, mid-2000s, um, mid 2008, I think, was when we, we did some work on that and worked with uh, Sue Haig uh, and others in her lab to do some genetics work. But I think it's worth re-analyzing some data there and using some new techniques to look at 
the genetics of yellow rails across their range nationally. Uh, we're, there's many folks out there interested in yellow rails, not just the Western birds. And so we're thinking it might be worthwhile to have a yellow rail symposium at some point to uh, all of us get together and talk about yellow rail conservation nationally. Uh, and addition, uh, we're also going to focus in particularly on Perfect. restoration mm -hmm. opportunities in the breeding grounds. Uh, there are a lot of folks well, now yellow interested yellow. in Cornell in folks. that work and um, re, uh, really gives us some optimism yeah. about uh, yeah. being able to restore really some habitats uh, to keep yeah. that population secure. Yeah. We don't know a lot, though, about the winter range to do something similar there, hoping to find out more soon. With that, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, I want to thank you all. And now it's time for questions. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see everybody. And uh, yeah, wait for the hands, put them in <laughs> chat. Well, thanks so much for a really interesting presentation. I've definitely learned a lot about yellow rails and the videos of them is so cool since you don't really get to see them. So that's a real treat. Um, people can raise their hand for questions or post them in the chat and we'll make sure that they get answered. <laughs> I can, oh, there's one from Mark. If you're talking, Mark, there you go. Yeah, there we go. Okay, yeah. Um, I was wondering if, uh, with using the call that Chris Butler and those guys discovered um, down in California, do you guys have a standardized protocol for that, or? So, yeah. yeah, we got a lot of input from Chris Butler and Tabitha and and others um, in uh, Texas and Louisiana. Um, on what they did and what was successful for them. And so we combine that with how we know Yellow Rails Act in the Western U.S. And, and Lori did put together a, uh, a pretty systematic methodology for surveying for the rails um, in California. Yeah. Fingers crossed we actually hear some, get, get a response. Um, it is important to note that during the breeding season, Yellow rails, unlike other secretive marsh birds, yellow rails, the peak calling time is around midnight. Um, for most secretive marsh birds, peak calling time is, is right about sunset. Um, so there is a difference there. During wintering, information so far suggested that peak calling time for wintering birds using that bugle call in Texas was around sunset. Um, so we're not just taking our breeding season survey methods and applying them in the winter. We're actually using what they've they've discovered in Texas and trying to apply that in California. Okay, cool. Thank you. Ken. Yeah, hey, thanks, guys. Uh, bird, uh, the only yellow rail I've ever seen was in the beak of a great egret that had stabbed it in a rice field and was trying to eat it and drown it. And I had it in the scope. It was pretty cool um, in Louisiana. Um, so you mentioned reanalyzing the genetic data. I mean, from the original analyses, was there any evidence that this Western yellow rail was, you know, distinct in any way, distinct population? Uh, is there a possibility that it connects to the eastern ones you know with some isolated marshes that maybe we don't know about across southern canada or something like that i mean what's the what do you think there yeah um the the analyses that were done showed that there wasn't a lot of genetic structure distinguishing the western from the the rest of the pop birds um it did show that uh it did suggest that there had been some genetic bottlenecks uh, reduced heterozygosity in the Western birds and in so, um, some of the samples from the ones we collected in the Midwest as well. So um, we think, though, that there's there's more that could be done uh, and that maybe some techniques now might show a more refined picture. Uh, and uh, we don't really have any other evidence that there's crossover between the birds in the West and the ones in the East, but we really have no idea. 
and uh, nor do we have much um, we have no history obviously before um, of, of how recent this Western population is. It's, I mean, the first record in the West was 1900 in Oregon. Uh, but, um, you know, it would be, we think that, that we could uh, explore this a little bit more thoroughly. It would be great to do maybe some genoscaping uh, and maybe some other, other methods. So, yeah. And I'll, you, I'll add, add, yeah, I'll add that uh, since we did that genetic work with USGS, uh, there's been a lot more yellow whales found in Alberta, especially in the tar sands area, which is uh, one of the reasons that it's a special concern in Canada because of the development that's occurring there. Um, but also additional birds found in British Columbia and even a, uh, a juvenile yellow whale found in Western Oregon, um, Northern Northwestern Oregon, basically, uh, um, in the winter a couple of years ago. So uh, unless one of the yellow whales at a known breeding site in Oregon decided to fly north for the winter, um, there's a chance that that bird came from British Columbia or maybe an unknown site in Washington. Um, there's a couple of historic observations in Washington, but but nothing recent. Um, and, uh, I failed, we failed to mention there did used to be a separate subspecies in Mexico, uh, that hasn't been observed for about 50 years. Um, so if anybody would like to contribute some funding for me and Mike to go down there, you know, we're, we're happy to, to, to do that. Someone should. Uh, I see a couple of questions. Sarah Kendrick asked, uh, what do we feel our greatest expertise needs are within the Western Working Group? And thinking about it for a minute, um, you know, a social scientist might be helpful. I, again, I think our group would benefit from um, a more uh, more diversity. Uh, and we're, we've got a few tribes on the list who have expressed some interest. I mentioned we're going to be reaching out to them soon. Uh, I think some landowners, um, engaging more landowners um, would be worthwhile, either directly to the working group or somehow else. Um, Ken, can you think of anything more along those lines? Yeah, I guess uh, thinking about the, the wintering side of things, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get a better feel for where they go because currently they're not being considered at all in any management plan in California, basically, because they haven't been documented. So uh, once that happens, we're hopeful that, you know, they can be included along with the other uh, likely rail species in California. And then timing wise, we don't know when they migrate or where, where they molt. So uh, management questions uh, around hang or prescribed fire or water management in the fall could be a big issue. Paul, I see your question about conservation recovery plans. You know, a five-year strategic plan for our group is on the list. Uh, we haven't even framed that up, but in my mind, I think something that would be effective for us would be a list of projects, the amount of money it takes to accomplish them and um, who might be the primary one responsible for that. So a real simple um, spreadsheet of who, what, when, where, how much type of a thing would get us launched uh, to be a more effective working group. And um, that's the next thing after we finalize our charter. comment. Thank you, Thomas. We love that. Uh, is it seeing Tom will on 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 here makes reminds me when Ken and I were collecting genetic samples in the Midwest. Um, I was with Tom when he uh, had one of his probably one of many near death experiences uh, in the marsh. I, we almost lost him out there. So it's always, whenever I see Tom on a Zoom, um, I'm reminded of that moment. I'm still here, Mike. 
we can go out in the marsh again, buddy. It was it was a quite an experience. I will say that. <laughs> Miles is on. Miles, do you have anything you wanted when a dad? Did we mischaracterize your work? Did, did we? Uh... Oh, I I thought it was great. Um, yeah, I, I thought you guys did a a great job. Um, I guess one thing I'll say about the uh like distinctness of the Western population and um possible uh breeding locations between Oregon and the main the main uh breeding population um there was a historical population at least some breeding records from the Yellowstone area um and so I think in my mind I think there's decent potential that uh, historically, the it was a more continuous population, um, and either those, I guess, intermediate areas have blinked out from habitat loss, or we're just not detecting them right now. Great point. L looking as you go north and then uh, through Canada as well, I, I can't help but think that there might be sort of... A, we're just looking at the southern end of what might have been a more continuous um, northern distribution of breeding birds uh, that bridged across Canada. So um, there's probably more work to be done. It, it, a lot of those places just aren't birded, or you know. So um, that's another that's another uh, field trip for me and Ken, uh, if anyone's got money for that. You know, something else we failed to mention in the beginning is there's only about 15% of the historic wetlands left in the climate basin. So no doubt uh, that there was a much, much, much more habitat um, a couple hundred years ago in the climate basin uh, before uh, most of the wetlands were diked and drained for, for agricultural purposes. Um, also historically, um, over a hundred years ago, there were some reports of literally scores of yellow whales being seen in the San Francisco Bay area during the winter. So um, yeah, no doubt this, this population was much larger and maybe was more connected to the main population. And I know breeding data is a bit limited, but have you noticed any changes in breeding phenology from those early surveys to the more recent surveys with the earlier shift in melt? As Mike alluded to it, I think the biggest difference is in the early years, uh, on a couple of our surveys, Mike and I had to wade into really deep habitat meaning tall vegetation like tules and cattails and but it was very rare um and memorable in a painful way and uh sadly in the recent years uh, uh that's become quite common um that because uh, normally that really deep vegetation is in deep water but now, uh, because water levels have dropped so much, that really tall vegetation is in shallow water. Uh, so that's the biggest difference. It's also, yeah, we don't know how a timing has changed. We don't know dates of arrival or departure. Um, I, I can imagine that the breeding season is being squished into a smaller period of time. Um, back when I was finding nests, the active nests were always uh, in an area where there was a, a few centimeters of water. And then as soon as the nest hatched, as things dried up, the, the birds moved uh, to stay in an area where there was a little bit of water. So um, that's, that's, they, they, that's where I always say water is number one, and then the vegetation is, is not as they're not as particular about that, but yeah, timing wise, we don't know. 
welcome. Thank you. Are there any final questions? It looks like that might be it, but I'm sure if uh, anyone has any further questions and want to reach out to Ken or Mike or have us put in touch, put you in touch, let us know. Thanks, everyone. So let me, uh, uh, this is uh, Paul, I'll do some final closing remarks if I can, while we still have your attention. <clears throat> uh, a thanks to Ken and Mike. Great presentation. We really appreciate it. Great job. Uh, and this is a continuing in a, a, a strong quality presentations in this a series. Remember, reminder to you all, uh, the workshop of next week. And so please link in, uh, stream in if you're not able to attend in person. Uh, our next uh, webinar will be February the 9th at one o'clock Eastern, and it will focus on the Cerulean Warbler. Um, so please uh, uh, tune in to that one a month from now. Again, they are the second Friday of every month at one o'clock p.m. Eastern. And the recording uh, for this uh, presentation will be available on our website um, sometime after next week's uh, workshop. So look for that. And if you want to pick up on any of the past webinars, they are already down uh, uploaded onto uh, our website. Again, thanks very much, Quinn, for organizing, and and certainly to uh, to Ken and Mike for your presentation. Everybody have a uh, wonderful weekend, and see some of you all next week. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Great job, guys.